talk a little bit about Hactic and tell you folks what we are doing out in Amsterdam in Holland. Hactic is started out as a magazine and not so much as a club of people. This is I'll show you what a Hactic looks like. This excellent set of back issues happens to be for sale, but we'll get to that later. Uh, looks a bit like this. It's a magazine. It's not unlike 2600. I'll get to what the differences are later. And we can get into that a little bit more. Um, I'll tell you a bit about the history. Hactic started back in 1989. Um, uh, at that time, there was a group of people that felt that there was a large discrepancy be between what people were led to believe about technology and, which, and the things that we found to be actually true, because we were breaking into computer systems. We were finding that there was hardly any security. Computer systems that we came across were usually flaky. The people that were running them didn't know what they were talking about. Um, network, the days of networking were just beginning in, in 1989, um, and the people operating the networks had no idea what they were talking about, and we found, we found this to be true almost anywhere. Yet people were led to believe that it was all functioning perfectly, and, and you couldn't turn on your TV or some company was saying that they all had it down and it worked perfectly and there was absolutely no problem whatsoever. And we saw a lot of problems. We saw problems of uh, people not having access to this new technology, information not being shared with people that should have access to it. We saw problems of security, people having their data in computers and trusting these, these computers and, and these government agencies and hospitals and everything with their data when it was very possible for other people to break into it. And we also saw a subculture of people that understood the risks and was having fun breaking into computer systems and telling each other about these risks and, and was really developing a real yeah, underground information network to share this information. Um, we did decide that it would be a good idea if these people had their own magazine and their own voice because a lot of hackers tend to be fairly paranoid for, for good reason. They, they are prosecuted in some countries and they don't get jobs anymore once companies know that you're involved with this group of people. So hackers tend to be fairly paranoid, which makes it difficult for the press and, and for the, the public at large to get a coherent voice out of hackers, to get a coherent opinion out of them. So we decided it'd be a good idea to have a central point where all the information came together and, and publish a magazine from there. Um, in 1989, we also hosted together with Paradiso, a uh, cultural center in Amsterdam, and also a music center, very well known. We hosted the Galactic Hacker Party. Um, it was an international conference where hackers from all over Europe and actually from all over the world could meet and get together and discuss political issues. And it was one of the first meetings where hackers from all over the world started discussing making information free, getting the information out there. Um, we also, one of, one of the things we see as our role is publishing things that either the phone company or large computer corporations or governments do to control people or to keep tabs on them and expose what they are doing, expose the real technical facts. I can give you a few examples of that. And what I think the best example is, um, how about half a year ago, there was a very well-known court case in Holland where a large ecstasy gang was being prosecuted on, uh, on phone taps, on wire taps from all their mobile telephones. But because these, these uh, people were, were swapping cell phones with each other and with other people and cell phones were going all over the place, it was very hard for the government to get wire taps on each phone. The other thing is the government at that time didn't really have the possibility to wire tap into the central office where all the phone calls go out to the normal telephone system. So instead they decided to, to build a radio scanner and a, a hook a tape recorder up to it and, and through some special cir uh, circuitry uh, have the radio scanner tap all the cell phone calls that were close to it. And then on the tapes they'd filter out the calls made by these criminals and put them on tape and use them as evidence. And we proved to, to the court and, and through the press also to the people, we proved that this was not the way to do it because they must have been tapping hundreds if not thousands of other people. We proved that this is not how a government should go about catching criminals. Um, 
that case is still in court. There, there's now an appeal pending, so we don't know what's going to happen. But the thing is, nobody, until we came around, nobody questioned what the phone company and the police were saying. They all said, well, we've just tapped these criminals using this radio scanner. And it takes a hacker mind, it takes a few hackers out there to show, hey, you can't just tap one phone with just a scanner and a tape recorder. You have to listen to all these bits on the air, and they aren't doing that, so they must be tapping everybody. And by asking the right questions, we got them to admit that. There's another good example where uh, the Dutch phone company, this is really funny, the, um, the Dutch phone company at one point uh, was charged uh, that it was possible through their standard telephone, we have a standard telephone in Holland, much like the, the old standard telephone that, that was used here, it's no longer in production, but it's called the T65, and somebody uh, found out that you could, through the T65, out of literature, he didn't do it himself, through the T65 you could listen to conversations in a room even if the phone was on the hook, if you had access to the bare phone wire. Um, and we published that and we even did it just to, to demonstrate it. And the phone company denied, denied everything. They said, no, there's no way, you cannot do that. You can't listen to phone conversations through the wire if, if the receiver's on the hook. So, uh, especially Bill, but also some other people, spent some time actually building the device and then we could show people, look, you can't do it, here it is. And even though the debate would have happened without us, the, the debate on this, it would have been inconclusive because nobody would have had the mind and the, the knowledge of the phone system to actually build the device. So I'm just pointing out some, some useful things about what, how the hacking knowledge can be useful. How having knowledge in the society, people that, that know about telephone systems, computers, telecommunications, and are not working for the government, they're not working for major corporations, so they can open their mouths if something goes wrong. They can tell society what's going on if it's not working. Um, together with that, of course, and that's also in Hacktic, a lot of articles are about that. Together with that comes a responsibility for hackers. Hackers are, a lot of hackers are young people. Uh, I know hackers that are 12, 13 years old. And I think teaching people to hack is like teaching people karate. You have to teach a responsibility along with the, with the knowledge. You can teach people how to break into computer systems, but you also have to teach them it's probably not good to do this and destroy computer systems. It's not good to erase other people's work. It's not good to violate people's privacy. So it's very important, I think, to also teach people what not to do with this newfound knowledge, this newfound power that they have. Um, what else should I talk about? What else have we done? Um, then 1992 came along, 19, end of 1991, and it really started when four or five hackers were kicked off an internet system that some of them had legal accounts on and others were hacking mm -hmm. into. And four or five people found themselves without any internet access. Internet at that time in Holland did not have a public access provider. There was nobody offering internet except to major corporations and universities for thousands of dollars a month. And if you didn't like that, you could always get mail and news, but not the online access. And even mail and news were incredibly expensive. Um, so we decided to do it ourselves and set up a, uh, an internet provider. We called it Access for All, which is written XS for ALL. Um, that got really popular real fast, even though the internet community frowned upon it badly because they felt, this is weird, hackers that are breaking into our computer systems and then we kick them off our computer systems and then they buy a house and become our neighbors. Um, so <laughs> there goes the neighborhood, yeah. Um, but since we were the only internet provider and we set the, the cost for internet access in Holland really, really low so nobody, for the first few months, nobody felt like competing with us. All these very well-known and famous people that happened not to be working for university or major corporation were suddenly having .hactic.nl in their email address. And even the head of the, of the Dutch uh, police force that chases high-tech criminals is actually known as fridge at cri.hactic.nl. <laughs> so we were 
putting up a public access service that was much wider than the hacker community. We were putting people on the internet. And now there's other providers, but for about a year we were the only ones. Um, that gave the hacker image a real boost, a real boost because we had a really good image when we started. Because people saw us as like the Robin Hoods fighting the system. Oh, this is really good. Finally, some people that can do something about big corporations storing my data. And then the government had to push through their new computer crime laws because of pressure exerted on them from Germany and from the United States. And so all this bad publicity happened about how much economic damage hackers were doing to Dutch companies. And for a while, it looked the hacker image was really fairly grim. Hackers were people that broke into computer systems and broke things and didn't do any good at all. But this setting up of Access for All has really helped us in, in breaking open the situation and in, in creating a new image of hackers. Even though the same people that set up Access for All are still involved in breaking security and, and seeing what's out there and how it's hackable. Um, we also organized Hacking at the End of the Universe in uh, 1993, somewhere of last year, which is a convention not unlike this one, except that we had, uh, we had it out in tents and uh, on a campsite in the middle of nowhere. Um, but it was fun. It lasted three days. And it was, there was a lot of people coming together there. We had a pirate radio station, uh, a network on the internet, uh, workshops all happening simultaneously, but also in a big auditorium tent. Um, that was a lot of fun. And one of the ideas that came out of the Hacking at the End of the Universe was to set up the Digital City, which is a free net we are operating out of Amsterdam. The Digital City now has 40 modems hooked up to it. It's a Sun workstation, and it's running software that allows people to communicate with each other real easily. And we chose a city metaphor, so people can actually walk around streets and do things, meet each other. Um, it is really a city. Um, sorry? It's still going. It's, its internet address is dds at no, dds.hactic.nl, and you can tell that to it. Most of it's in Dutch, though, although we're working on a bilingual version of this. Hmm? Now, um, DDS, I'll, I'll say it later at the end because there's a number of addresses I'd like to give you folks. Um, the, the Digital City in the beginning was sponsored by the city of Amsterdam because they were putting their public information on there. They still are. And it's also still sponsored by the city of Amsterdam. But they are putting all the city documents that they have, the, like the transcripts from all the city council meetings, uh, all the public information, like uh, at what time does a, a city swimming pool on the other side of town open and close, from the most mundane stuff to the mail addresses of all the politicians and everything. That's all in the digital city. And right now, the digital city is also receiving money from the Ministry of Economic Affairs in Holland and from, uh, I think, the Ministry of Cultural Affairs. And we're looking for a grant from the Ministry of Education. So we are actually a government-sponsored thing now. There's hackers now setting up the digital city together, I should mention, with the Cultural Center de Bali in Amsterdam, which is also participating. And we're really working on getting information out to the people. There's really a lot of hackers that are putting part of their energy into making the system work. Um, I should also touch the issue of security on the, the hacktic systems. Because we've had people break into Access for All and crack root on it. And we've had people break into the digital city. Um, we're giving people half a year of free access if they tell us how they did it. And, <laughs> And that's made Access for All, I think, one of the most secure systems on the internet. Because everybody wants, we've made it sort of an honor thing. There's people that have hacked root four times. There's people that have, have hacked it only once. And if people hack root three times, they get to be invited on the security panel where they can advise on making Access for All even more secure. So that's, even though we're setting up a really legitimate public access internet Unix site, we're still trying to prove to people that communicating with hackers and using their skills and knowledge to make the system more secure is a much more sensible approach 
then trying to send the FBI after them and not doing anything about your system security. But it's an ongoing battle. Unix will never be secure. Systems will never be secure. That's, we'll see what happens. Um, after that, uh, the government tried to make crypto cryptography in all, in all forms illegal. We were really shocked by that. It came out of the blue. Um, because criminals are using cryptography, cryptography should be totally illegal, was the basic idea of the law. And instead of first pushing clipper, they were trying to do what I would call a paper clipper. They were, they were trying to get everybody to register their public keys with the government. So they'd have a clipper without having the actual hardware. They'd just have everybody's public key in a register somewhere, which is a really funny idea, and it's really crazy. And that has, of course, we were very much against it from the very beginning, but that's, that was to be expected. But it's also triggered in Holland a movement of people that suddenly woke up and said, hey, this is not, this is not possible. That can be happening. And we've had some really good press. And there's, there's now actually a movement of people against this type of law, working on understanding all these issues and, and impact of technology and impact of these new laws, a movement that is much wider than the hacker community has ever been. Um, so that's, that's really good, that, that even though the law did not go through this time, they will come back with it again. But because they made such a foolish attempt at it the first time, there is a movement going of people that are watching out for it. And there's an infrastructure ready of people that are willing to fight it. Lawyers, uh, there's pe politicians, people that are good at lobbying. It's not just us hackers anymore. That's very good. Um, what else should I be talking about? Uh, oh, I can give you guys a scoop because Hacktake's almost, the new Hacktake, I don't have an issue with me, is about to hit the newsstands and we hacked the prepaid chip card system that's out in Holland. It's, it's, I think it's a pan-European system, the Germans have it too. But, no, 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 it's the same system, it's a chip card prepaid system. And um, we've hacked this system and we've built a program for the PC that does an emulation of it over the printer port. So your PC can pretend to be a chip card. Now in all other countries in Europe, they have these nasty flaps that go after, the, after you stick the card in, there's a flap, that a door that closes behind the card. But the Dutch have phones where you can still touch the card while it's actually reading the chip. This is because the Dutch are paranoid. They don't trust machines that take your cards. So, oh, same in England. Well, the, the Brits are paranoid too then. Um, so that's, so even though we're, we're working on, on giving people access to the internet and we're doing all these, uh, let's say, mainstream, above ground things, we are still working. If, if a new piece of technology comes out and phone companies or other organizations are claiming that it's really, really, really secure, we still go out and see if it really is secure. We still go out and find out if we can hack it. So there's, we're keeping that knowledge alive as well because it is important and God forbid if things ever go wrong, if this society ever falls towards a uh, towards dictatorship, then we are going to need people that know how to break into computer systems, that know how to subvert technology because all this beautiful technology that's being set up around us today could be used against us. And if it is, we're going to need as many people as possible that understand how it works. They don't have to go on the streets and, and clone cell phones today as long as they have the mindset to understand how this technology works. They have the mindset to not sit there and say, oh, it's technology, I can't do anything about it. Because there is scary things happening. Governments all over the world are working on registering our every move. There's now boxes that you can hook up to a video camera that have video import on one side and then license plates come out serially on the other side. There's, there's interesting devices being made to enable governments to control what, I, what we are doing. As I was saying, cellular phones are being tracked down by 100 or 200 meters now if you're trying to make a call with the new digital systems. Government. Oh, sure. Government, <laughs> government is subcontracting. That's... Um, 
because is I think um, it's not as scary as when the government is doing it, because um, the government is somewhat controlled by the public. I think it's much more scary actually if public corporations are doing it because they are not controlled that much. Sure, but what I'm saying is we need even if even if if you think we don't need the knowledge today, I think that's that's a debatable thing. That's a broader political debate. Even if you think that, that today's government is really not that bad, it's still probably wise to keep some of the knowledge alive. That's what we're trying to do. Um, well, what else can I say? I can say we're opening up a new worldwide web server for people on the internet. It's the same address as what's written there, it's, except that it's not DDS, but WWW, World Wide Web. Uh, it should be open by the end of September, so in about a month and a half. There should be quite a bit of information on there. Uh, this excellent set of back issues is available with me for $50. It contains five years worth of hacktic, and it's really a stack of paper this big, so it's going to keep you reading for a while, if you speak Dutch, of course. Uh, but there is a lot of schematics and everything in there. It's, it's Hey, get a dictionary. They're not that expensive. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, what else can I say except, um, yeah, I want to thank uh, the Chaos Computer Club, uh, TAP Magazine, even though Richard Cheshire has already left back to Florida, uh, 2600 Magazine, and uh, lots of other people for all the inspiration they've given us over the years, and say hi. <laughs>